Hello and welcome to this overview of the research process. My name is Brian Miller and I'll be guiding you through this tutorial. There are some things you need to know when engaging in research. First and foremost, true scientific research is about the relationship between two or more variables. Two, that which cannot be measured cannot be studied scientifically for measurement is the essence of science. And three, Statistics is the lingua franca of science. Statistics is what allows physicists to talk to anthropologists, to talk to chemists, to talk to psychologists. It's a common language. Let's get started. First, it's story time with Dr. Miller. This is a story that may or may not have happened once upon a time. So I walked in one afternoon to find my mom scrolling through web pages furiously. I asked her, hey mom, what are you doing? She responded, I'm doing research on the common cold. Your niece is sick again. Well, what are your hypotheses? Huh? If you're doing research, then you must be hypothesizing the relationship between two variables. One is the common cold, what's the other? No, Einstein, not that type of research. Well, then you're just conducting a literature review. I'm not writing literature, doofus. I'm finding some remedies for your niece's cold. Well, Mom, did you get approval from the Institutional Review Board for your data collection using human subjects? You see, these sorts of comments are why you don't have any friends. Why can't you be more like your sister? Oh, you mean the one who's on her fourth husband and lives in the trailer park? Don't get smart with me, son. You're not too big for me to take a switch to your backside. Clearly from this story, research means different things to different people. We will look at research from the scientific point of view. Sorry, Mom. Let's move on. So what is research? As I mentioned, of course, research is about the relationship between two variables. A variable is something on which an observation can vary. For example, human sex, biological sex, has two levels, male and female. Human age has an infinite number of levels if you put the age into gradations as fine as seconds. Those are just two things on which people can vary, but variables can involve things other than people. Sizes of companies, shades of color, number of atoms, all sorts of different things. So research is about the relationships between these variables and it must use the scientific method. So the scientific method was developed long ago and first advocated by, I think, Aristotle. Um, and it's come a long way since then, but basically with the scientific method, you must collect data about hypotheses which are falsifiable. So in other words, you have to measure stuff. You have to first have hypotheses, and these hypotheses have to be falsifiable. If a hypothesis can only come out as true, such as the sky is blue, well, we know it's blue, it's always blue, it's blue, it's blue, it's blue. Well, then that's not a hypothesis. Another hypothesis about sky color might be what shades of blue is the sky and what causes those shades to vary. So that could be two variables there. Of course, as I mentioned, the hypotheses must be falsifiable. If a hypothesis cannot be falsifiable, it's not a hypothesis. So research is really about looking at how two things co-vary. In the aforementioned one about gender, uh, sex, and age, you might, you might have one where, oh, I don't know, are female managers younger or older than male managers? So now we have age and we have sex, all right? They're all managers, so that does not vary. Now, we can find out if that is true or false. And from these hypotheses, we gather data to make inferences. The very notion of statistics is based upon inferential statistics, which is a product of making inferences from samples about populations. If we could measure everything in our population of interest, maybe all the atoms in the universe, then we wouldn't need statistics. We would simply measure them all and find out what's what. 
But instead, we can very seldom measure an entire population on all the variables of interest. So we gather data from samples, which should be representative of the population, and we make inferences about the population from those samples. Research proceeds in at least three phases, the first of which is formulation, and the first step in that is define the problem. Well, maybe the problem is you find that you're having uh, high levels of turnover in your male managers. Well, it may be a function of age. It may not be a function of organizational commitment, outside employment opportunities. It could be a multitude of things. So you're interested in finding out why are top managers who are male more likely to leave the firm than female managers who are at the top of the firm? Well, first you would have to conduct a, a literature review, just like I tried to convince my mom that she was doing. So in a literature review, you find all of the extant scientific literature that has studied the relationship that is of interest to you or relationships that are similar. So maybe you find multiple studies on entry-level employees who leave the firm early based upon their own biological sex. Then hopefully you can generalize to the population of managers. Managers and entry-level employees are distinct populations, but your literature review will help inform the rest of your research, and you must examine theory. There's got to be a theory for this. Maybe the theory is that, uh, oh, I don't know, continuous commitment is low amongst males, lower amongst males than females. That is, the willingness to stay with a firm because of the calculation that leaving would cost too much to the person is the organizational uh, commitment theory that you're using. So now we're looking at not just managers and subordinate employees, we're looking at is organizational commitment in the form of continuance commitment related to sex or different based upon sex? Well, those are general research questions. Is organizational commitment different for males than females? That's a pretty general research question exactly what we want. When we're first formulating research, we think in broad generalities about why did that happen? What's going on there? Why are these two things different? And then we boil it down a little bit. In the second phase, we begin some execution. This is where we start the sampling method, and I have a whole lecture on that later. The sampling method means, do we have a truly representative sample of the population? In the social and behavioral sciences, that is very rare. So we might have a convenience sample that we hope to make broad generalizations about the population from. Uh, in the world of academia, convenience samples are most often student samples. Are students a representative sample of the rest of the world? No. Are they convenient? Oh, yeah. And so we would use that. Then we would collect some sort of, uh, I mean, design some sort of data collection form. The goal there is, if you're using a survey, a self-report inventory to measure organizational commitment, well, then you've got to go to the literature and find an appropriate scale for that, and you have to organize the items or the statements or the questions in an appropriate way. And half of these lectures in this sequence are going to be about survey design and implementation. And there is not only an art, but there is a science to survey design. Then you go out and collect the data. You get people to complete your surveys or participate in your experiment or agree to be observed in their jobs or participate in a focus group, whatever the data collection technique is. After you've collected the data, data, you check for errors. Well, checking for errors is really important because sometimes people will get out of sequence. Let's say they're responding to a survey using a Scantron form, and your last question is, what is your sex, male or female? And somebody puts E. And then you look, and all of the questions have been, you think, shifted down because they skipped question 17. And what they 
wanted to put for 17 is now in the 18 blank. What they wanted to put for 18 is now in the 19 blank, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down. Well, that's probably an error. Can we infer that they meant or did not mean to do that? No, we would probably throw that data out. There's no E on sex. And then you code the data. And so coding it will involve turning verbal responses into numeric data. So information is turned into data. And you would code sex, 0 and 1. Okay, you would code the level of organizational commitment using a 1 to 7 Likert response scale, if that's what you use to collect it. And then, of course, you store the data. And then in, in the common world of academia, you have to store your data for any published study for at least five years and make it available to anyone who asks you for it in the first five years after the paper is published. Now, if you're working for a company and collecting data, you're going to keep that for sure because you may be able to build on that data and provide your employer with more meaningful information about whatever it is they're seeking to find. Let's move on. Okay, in phase three of the research, we begin to analyze the data. The second half of this sequence of survey uh, of uh, presentations is on data analysis using the general linear model. So when we analyze data in a general linear model, we assume that there's a linear relationship between X and Y. The general linear model subsumes all forms of linear analysis beneath them, such as correlation, bivariate regression, multiple regression, t-test, analysis of variance, also known as ANOVA, analysis of covariance. All of those things are subsumed in the general linear model. And in fact, here's a little tip for your next cocktail party conversation. Any test underneath regression can be done in regression. Yes, you can use multiple regression to do a t-test. You can use multiple regression to do analysis of variance. You can use multiple regression to do correlation. Multiple regression subsumes all other lower order techniques in the general linear model. Well, after you've analyzed the data, of course, you have to interpret and make inferences from the data. So if you find that the organizational commitment level amongst your male managers is higher than it is amongst your female managers or lower as the case may be, then you have to infer from that, okay, the inference is that men are less or more committed to the organization based upon these data. Now, hopefully the data are free from error. You screen them for errors, miscodings, things like that, okay? And from these inferences and interpretations, you then either find support or no support for the hypotheses. You can never prove a hypothesis. You never say we prove the hypothesis. You can say in this sample, we found support for the hypothesis about the population. Most of the time, we just say we found support for the hypothesis. But technically, in this sample, we found support or did not find support for hypotheses about the general population. population. Well, of course, after doing that, we then identify limitations. There are always limitations. If you're using a convenience sample, the limitation is that it's going to be tough to generalize from the population of interest from, say, college students or from, say, people who walk across the corner of Maine and Elm at 3 p.m. every afternoon. Just not a truly representative sample of just about anybody except people who walk street walks at 3 p.m. I don't know. All right. Then you write it up. You write a report. Now, in academia, it's a, it's a little bit different. You have a, a special format you go through if you're writing this report for an organization for whom you work. Well, typically, you're going to come up with an executive summary that summarizes all the key aspects of it. And then you'll write a report detailing everything that you did in the study because these studies must be replicable. They must be able to be replicated. You must provide all the information that is necessary for someone else to do the exact same study. 
And this has become a problem in social psychology in the last several years because what happens is people found that their studies were not replicable. And the classic one is by a guy named Barg at Yale or Harvard, one of those schools. And he found that after showing college students films or videos of elderly people engaging in just regular behavior, they, the people who watched the videos then walked slower leaving the experimental viewing room than before they walked in. That's it in a nutshell. So viewing old people makes you walk slower, supposedly. No one has been able to replicate that study. So it doesn't matter how well he showed what it is that he did. Perhaps he just found some oddball sample. And from that sample, he generalized to the population, and it was not an appropriate generalization. Well, let's move on. Well, there is a role for theory in research. Theory is the basic fuel of research. It offers explanations and predictions. So think about explanations and predictions. Why did that happen? If you see someone cut in line at the grocery store and people behind them don't say anything to them, you have to kind of figure, well, why did that person not get reprimanded for cutting in line? Well, maybe I wasn't around to see them ask the people behind them to hold their position in line while they went and got something from a nearby stack of food. Maybe the people behind them are just shy people and not willing to stand up for themselves. Maybe when the person stepped in line, they turned around and gave an evil glare to everyone in the line as if to say, don't mess with me. Those are some explanations that we might find uh, we might offer for why that happened. Well, from that explanation, we can then make predictions and we could design an experiment. And from that experiment, we can test whether the evil glare actually works on regular people or whether asking people to hold your place in line allow, forces them, not forces, um, makes them more cooperative regarding holding your place in line. And then base, basically, for how long? What if you're near the end of the line? There's only a couple people behind you. You ask those people to hold your place. You go get something. When you come back, there's even more people behind you. Now you're cutting in front of people who did not see you ask to have your spot held. Okay, all of those things are rife for investigation. Theory helps develop normative decision rules that suggest what should be done when faced with a, a situation like the theory. And so basically we would come up with decision rules, normative meaning prescriptive, meaning what is supposed to happen. Well, if you turn around and give an evil glare to people in line behind you, most people are probably not going to say anything, okay? So the normative decision rule is if the person cutting in line gives you the evil glare, you're going to let them cut in line. There are a multitude of gaps in knowledge used to develop these normative decision rules. Think about the social behavioral sciences. Think about all of the possible variables that exist and all of the levels of those variables that exist. And by the way, it is infinite, okay? And then you can think about the relationship between an infinite number of variables. And now we have infinite factorial, which is infinite, which means there are an infinite number of areas available and rife for study. However, some of the most interesting, some of the most perplexing ones have already been studied. They can provide us through their use of theory. They can provide us with theory in our own studies. So people will often ask me, well, Dr. Miller, has there ever been any research on stop? I say stop. The answer is yes. Now, on what? Well, has there ever been any research on X and Y? Yes, there has, I'm sure. Let's look in some of the research databases like PsycInfo or ABI Inform, and let's find out. And lo and behold, all the cool stuff's already been studied, but there are some nice little areas where you can make a niche. Theory is very practical. It narrows down the things that need to be studied. Occam's razor says that the simplest explanation is usually the best explanation. Occam, O-C-C-A-M, Occam's razor. Let me say that again. It says that the simplest explanation is usually the best explanation. 
So these theories that have a multitude of variables all intertwined and interrelated and such, they are usually so complicated that it's difficult to apply them to actual phenomenon in the world. Theory has to be practical. Why did that happen? Because the evil glare will give you permission to cut in line. That's why that happened. So these law-like generalizations then provide the hypotheses. Okay, now we can design an experiment by, if it's a very brief evil glare, will people call you out for cutting? If it's a moderately long evil glare, if it's a long evil glare, if it's a long evil glare with the baring of teeth and the gnarling and gnashing, will that be more likely to have people not say something to you? These are hypotheses which developed from our theory. From these hypotheses, we then determine what needs to be measured. Well, in this case, I had four different levels of the evil glare. The short evil, the medium evil, the long evil, and the long evil with the, the glare uh, gnashing of teeth. Okay, the baring of teeth as if in a wolf-like scowl, right? Okay, that's four different things that can be measured or manipulated in an experiment. And then the... Uh, how long you're gone from the line can be measured. How many people are behind you when you first cut can be measured. How many people are behind you when you come back to the line and cut in line? That all can be measured, and we have hypotheses about these different things. So theory provides an avenue towards use of the scientific method. Theory provides a rationale or a framework for understanding similar phenomenon in similar situations. It goes well beyond just intuition-based explanations. Theory allows us to actually test these explanations. Well, let's move on. Now we turn research questions into testable hypotheses as alluded to previously. The research question just states a general proposition. For example, is gender important in most jobs? That is a very general statement there. Most jobs, very general. Important, very general. How do you measure important? How do you manipulate it? What jobs? Very general question. How about, is an employee fitness program a good thing? That's very general. Right? What type of employee fitness program? What is a good thing? Is it good versus bad? Are there level, levels of goodness? Who knows? So a hypothesis is a formal, specific statement of some, some unproven supposition that tentatively explains certain facts or phenomena. So, for example, in the first uh, example above, is gender important in most jobs might be um, does gender contribute to performance in top management jobs? Or, in other words, do male uh, top managers outperform female top managers in top manager jobs, right? Or, in the second example above, regarding employee fitness programs, is an on-site, full-service employee fitness program going to be used by a majority of the employees? Or even more specifically, which employees will use the on-site employee fitness program? All right. It's unproven supposition. We don't know. We're going to find out. And once we find out, that will help us understand the phenomenon. So, Another one, female service employees report higher job satisfaction than male service employees. That's a very testable hypothesis that is obviously whittled down from a very general research question. Female service employees report higher job satisfaction than male service employees or participation in an employee fitness program will result in higher organizational commitment. Okay, those are testable. I'll buy that. Maybe my mom will too. Let's move on. To further illustrate, illustrate graphically the role of theory in the key research task, at the very top we have theory that will be leading to, permeating, or inducing three main things, which are, as you might surmise, interrelated themselves. 
So theory informs our research questions. Our research questions lead to hypotheses. The hypotheses are developed from research questions and based upon the same underlying theory that helped us develop the research question. And then we test those hypotheses. So theory also informs how it is we test the hypotheses. In other words, theory influences everything. Let's move on. Ah, the rigor of science. Data represents facts about hypothesized variable, and data are analyzed to determine the consistency with prediction. So, here's a simple question. Are men taller than women? Okay, we would look around and say, yeah. Okay, are men taller than women in the African pygmy population? Are men taller than women in the Dinka tribesmen of the Sudan? Are men taller than women in uh, southern Japan? Well, those are very clear hypotheses there. And so we would collect data on those. We would measure males and females on their overall body height in these very different populations. And from that, we would analyze it, and then we would find out if our uh, data is consistent with the prediction. I would say that pygmies are probably not statistically significantly different in height. Southern Japanese are probably a little more different, and Dinka tribesmen, the males, are a lot taller than the females. Okay, that makes sense to me. Hopefully, hopefully it does for y'all. If the data and the prediction are consistent, ta-da! The hypothesis is supported. Remember, I didn't say it's proven. It is not proven. We did not collect data on all the pygmies, the Dinka, and the southern island of Japan. We did not. But we have support for our hypothesis. And if we find that there is no difference in males and females in overall body height, well, then we simply did not find support. We did not disprove the hypothesis. We just failed to find support for the hypothesis. Maybe a bigger, more representative sample would have different results. Maybe a hypothesis about a different population would have different results. I think in Western society, particularly in America, um, men are, on average, taller than women. Yes, there are lots of women who are taller than men, and there are lots of men who are shorter than women and vice versa. But on average, men are taller than women. So it all depends on your population and the sample and sampling technique you use. Well, let's move on. Thanks. That's all for now.